Have you got your kids church yet? We want to invite you to head down that way. There's going to be a great rest of the church for you. If you're a kid at heart, we want you to continue staying right here in the service. Because we're all kids, right? We're all kids and kings. Child of God, saved by grace, His grace. Amen? we got a treat for you this morning, just real uh, quick before our sermon. And I'm not saying quick, but uh, we have a presentation. You may have seen it. You come into church this morning. A table with information on there about Teen Challenge, a ministry that's uh, run out of Pasco here and uh, all around. And uh, we want to invite you. Uh, they're going to come and share with us today a little bit about what they're doing. And if you have questions for them, I'm just going to let you know right now. They're going to be sitting out there again. So if you have questions, you want to talk to them about Teen Challenge, what they do, hear a little more about the testimonies that are going on with the, the men are in this ministry, I invite you after the service to stick around and talk with them. All right? So, I'm going to pass it over to you. Well, I appreciate, I appreciate you guys allowing us to be out here. My name is Philip, and I'm the Executive Director for the Men's Center here in Pasco. With us today also is the Executive Director for the Women's Jail Outreach, and she's in the back there waving. That's Kathy. Just give her a quick shout out. And uh, we have four areas of ministry here in the Tri-Cities that are operating. And one of them being the jail outreach, then the re one-year residential recovery home for men. That is the second. Third is the TC Resale and Donation Center. We helps us fund our ministry. When you guys got extra stuff in your closets you can get rid of, everything's just furniture in your house, taking up space in the garage. I heard a guy did the cat park in lawnmower outside this year. Uh, this winter, which is terrible. So if you have extra stuff, you need to get rid of it. That's what our TC Resale and Donation Center does. The last thing we do is BPM. BPM was started in Portland at Bridgetown Ministries, also known as Night Strike. They work under the Portland Bridge, uh, the bridge in Portland, and they help feed the homeless, give them haircuts, uh, foot washings, things like that. That ministry has been acquired by our, our ministry. And so we're going to start bringing that to the Tri-Cities. Already, every Friday night, we take our men who are in recovery, and we teach them how to serve. We teach them how to do what Jesus would do, care for the broken lost. Just because they're in recovery does not mean that they are not useful members to the kingdom. Amen. We believe that strongly, that we are to disciple these men. We are to take them and show them what we are to do as Christians, as a, as a body. We all operate in different areas of the body. I cannot do what maybe somebody else can. And our job is to find what they can do and let them do it. So that's a little bit about our ministry and who we are. We've invited some men today who are going to be sharing their testimony, where they came from, and how they got to the Team Challenge here. Just a quick survey. How many of you either know somebody or you yourself have been caught in the struggle of addiction? Know somebody or been in the struggle yourself. If you look around, it's quite a bit. It's a big problem in our community, in our area, around our nation, and around the world. So this is our fight that we've taken up. This is what we do. And I'd like to share with, with you one of our test or two of our testimonies. How we become a person. We are on a foundation. Use a Struggle for the Lord. Got injured, so he's doing all right. Hi, my name's Little Baba Omega. I was just jumping down in that canyon. We can't wait there. Trying to find some homeless people down there. It's all right. My name's Kyle Wolford. Um, I'm 31 years old. I've been struggling with addiction since the age of 11 years old. Um, I've been to the point of prison. Um, a little bit of the downside of the story. Um, I went to prison in 2012. Got out, didn't know structure. The only thing I knew was my addiction because I had just been struggling with it since 11 years old, didn't know how to work a job, really nothing like that to get a job. And then it uh, instantly relapsed, so I got out of work release from prison. And um, um, once again, um, fell in 2000, this, this last year, um, I fell in 2016, um, facing the eight months in prison, then four. But more property crime would extend to my addiction. Um, to be my addiction. So, 
if you didn't know nothing and, and uh, God, I do the Lord, you know, I'll be there, you know, like, okay. Um, but really, I, I came to found, I was in the kitchen, in the Benton County Jail, working in the kitchen, and I found a man who lived on the floor, you know, and um, uh, I was working with the chaplain, you know, and she kind of helped me do a lot of prayer time and stuff, and one-on-one, she pulled me out of the kitchen and do some prayer time with me, and I, I came to find that, um, you know, at the time, he turned my whole world, my whole life <coughs> And um, someone, I'm not going to say their name, is in the, in the congregation right now, that's really seen me come in to his area of employment really deep in my nation. Um, and, and I just want to thank him for his service, you know, who he is. Um, because he's also stepping to a little bit of my area. Um, but aside from that, um, uh, uh, I was in Bank County Jail and then with the chaplain, and um, I, I wrote a letter to the prosecutor. <coughs> prosecutor in many cases um, in Benton County, almost all my cases from Washington. And she knows, you know, that I've really didn't have to know how to you know, do anything besides just attempt to understand. With her and the help of um, um, the chaplain, um, and, or with my prosecutor, Megan Kilgore, and the, the help of you know, the chaplain of Benton County Jail and the intake coordinator and also our executive director, they helped me get into the Teen Challenge Board. Uh, the Lord is teaching me through the grid store how to learn vocational training and how to uh, learn to be in contact with people who are in my shoes, people who I know in my addiction, and it's helping me be strong enough to do this learning work abilities. And, uh, and uh, I believe I'm being pulled out of out of my, my prison sentence, which I have to go to court for next month. Um, um, we're talking about you know letting me just uh, move on with my life. Possibly put the sentence behind me and move on into an internship. So my goal is next year, this time, I'll be close to my end, the end of my internship. This next year, um, and my internship will be beginning in August, which will be moving to Shed Oregon to do. My internship will last a year. And after that, my ultimate goal is to become outreach coordinator for the Long Valley region. Praise God. So I want to thank you guys for your support. Buddhism, uh, you name it, just trying to find my way. 
Uh, I did Team Challenge last year in Spokane for about seven and a half months. Just was not ready to give my life to Christ. Cool. Um, was dismissed from the program, went out for three months in Spokane, did whatever I wanted, worked, relapsed. Um, a brother in the program that I knew from Spokane, he graduated from down here, opened up the doors for me to come here. I've been here now for four months. I just phased up in the program, had eight more months to go. And God has really opened doors for me with my heart. Um, working on canvases that will be auctioned off at our banquet in May. I've got opportunities at churches to airbrush artwork on their in their kids' wings. And just a very big calling to <coughs> ministry and to reach out to the younger generation. I've lost too many friends to addictions that are younger. Um, and I end up having a life, my life scripture. Matthew 17 20. So if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, um, you can tell this mountain to move and it will move, for nothing is impossible for you. And then I always, I've, I've come to find out, I thought I had no identity. I wore masks like no other. And through this program, in Romans 8, 11 through 17, it says, But the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you. He also raised Christ from the dead, who will also give life to your mortal bodies through His Spirit who dwells in you. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put the death, the deeds of the body, you will live. For as many are led by the Spirit of God, and these are the sons of God. You do not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you receive the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if we are children and heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs of Christ, and indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. And through that, it shows that I have an identity in Christ, and also an identity in life. And if it wasn't for his loving kindness, and mercy, and grace, I would be standing here before you today. Amen. Oh, to the holds. Amen? Yeah. All right. 
Well, we're in our second part of our series this, uh, called Believe this morning. And I want you to open up your Bibles to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 23. We're going to be there this morning uh, for a little bit. And if you don't have a Bible with you, that's okay. You can pull out your phone. We've got Wi-Fi here, your tablet, any of those things. Open up to Matthew, chapter 23. We're talking about this series called Believe. And uh, so many people, I think, in our world today, would like to believe in God. They hear about a good God, a great God, and they want to believe in something like that. But they just can't. You know, there's a hurdle in their life. And they don't know what it is. Maybe it's... Uh, Maybe it's like we talked about last week. They, they think God is an on-demand God. That when we ask for stuff, God's supposed to just look at his foot and give it to us. And I never got my Ferrari. <laughs> so I know, Mark, you're waiting on yours too. I, I never got my Ferrari, but maybe God's not even real. Because he didn't give me what I want. Mm. An on-demand God. And we talked about last week that our God is not an on-demand God. Amen. Our God is not an on-demand God. My God is so much greater, so much more sovereign, so much more powerful than a puppeteer of men and women. He is a God. And we ought to just uh, say maybe he wants a bit more relationship with us than just a I ask you give type of relationship. We're going to talk about in the next couple weeks about a goosebumps God. Maybe you feel like you, you go to church and, and there's people standing there and they're singing and they're waving their hands and they're crying and they're all emotional and you're standing there going, what? Mm. I, I'm not getting that. You know? And then and, and somebody will stand up here and they'll say, the Holy Spirit is moving today. Can you just feel it? And you're saying, no. I don't feel anything. It's kind of a nice, cushy seat. I like that. It's comfy, you know? But I don't feel a goosebumpy cup. And then the fourth week, we're going to talk about the, the hurdle of the heartless God. It's probably the most prevalent uh, view today. And that is, you know, why would God let good, or bad things happen to good people? Why, why, if God is such a loving God, would my spouse leave me or die? Why would terrorist things happen? All those things, these hurdles. And I think the problem is that many people want to believe in God but they have a misconception about who God really is. Maybe we're feeding that. I think they're rejecting not God the scripture. I think what they're rejecting is the God that the world is showing them. And that's not a good thing, is it? We need to show and shine light on the God of scripture, our great sovereign God. Not the God that is in me. And I don't mean the name, you know. I mean the me, the God that I make myself, all of my ideas. But God, the God that is right here in this book, what he says and what he does. Well, I want to look at today the killjoy God. I'm pretty sure that most of you in this room, you've either been a person who thought that God was a kill, killjoy God, or you've come into contact with somebody who said, I, I would like to think that God is a great guy, but he's got too many rules, too many regulations, man. I, it's, it's not fun being around God, because he says, I can't do this, I can't do that, don't do this, don't do that, you know, all these things, and God's just such a killjoy. Well, I want to maybe shine some light on it. I don't think the God of Scripture is a killjoy God. I don't think that at all. I think God loves to have a great time. Would you say that? I think God brings real joy. If you want to be happy, you're not going to be happy with anything in this world. I mean, really, joy, feel happy. That only comes from God and God alone. So I think if we look at the outside looking in, uh, on Christianity, a worldview looking into the windows of the church and the doors of the church. Uh, lots of studies have been done on this, and I think uh, what we come across, there's three great words that seem to be uh, synonymous with Christianity in the world today, and, and they're not very helpful words, I'm going to tell you that right now. If you ask just a, a guy on the street corner interview type thing, well, what do you think about Christians? The three words you would hear. 
a good majority of the time, well over 90%, are judgmental, hypocritical, and narrow-minded. That's what we're showing the world today, we as a church, as Christians. Judgmental, hypocritical, and narrow-minded. But here's the thing, folks. My God is not hypocritical. My God is not narrow-minded. He loves me. How can he be narrow-minded? He loves every single one of you guys. How can he be narrow-minded? Now, my God can be judgmental, but rightly so, because he is a holy and sovereign God. Amen. And he's the one that created, you know, the difference between right and wrong, what is holy and unholy. And so I give him that. God, would you be a judge? Would you judge me clearly? So that I could be holy in your sight. Would you correct and rebuke me? So we look at that and I think of some other words that people would use that Christians are boring or nerdy. You know, they're always got their nose in the Bible. They're never really living life. Maybe they're rigid and they don't know how to have fun. They don't have fun. Well, I've seen you some Christians that got some nice cars. So maybe the person who sees God as a killjoy God would view Christianity as a follow the rules, be nice, be safe, be boring type of faith. But if we view it that way, it's not Christianity, it's moral entity, right? It's not Christianity. Christ does not call us to be safe and be boring and be comfortable and be complacent. Christ calls us out there. He calls us to bring light into darkness. And you can't bring light into darkness in a room filled with light. This is a pretty bright place. We got a lot of light shining on right here. And a little darkness in the corners here and there. But overall, this is a place of light. Jesus wants us out in the darkness. Bring love and light. God is not a killjoy God. My life is going fine, so why should I follow a God who tells me to do or don't or do with, uh, the things that get in the way with what I want to do? That's a statement from my brother. He's told it to me over and over again. Why would I want to follow a God when I have everything I want right here? Why would I want to follow a God who says I can't do the things that I want to do? Too many rules, too many regulations. I, I want to unpack this a little bit today. Uh, if you're opening up to Matthew chapter 23, it's in your notes as well. Uh, I want to look about the good news today and the bad news. And there's always bad news, folks. Uh, it's not CNN or Fox News or any of those things. Okay? We do have bad news in the world. In the world, we live in a fallen and sinful place, but there is good news that can overcome that. We're going to look at two different things: some bad news and some good news. Uh, we're going to start by the bad news, and what I, I hope you'll understand is when uh, I want to talk about Jesus, which is the good news, and religion, which is the bad news. And some of you probably think, well, religion is not Christianity." I'm just going to throw that out right now. We can do anything religiously, habitually, and not be Christ-filled. So I want to look at religion today in that bad negative sense. I want to use that word as doing something religiously, and in this case, maybe some man-made rules to try to please God. There's a difference between Christianity and religion. I want to talk first about bad news about religion. It's this. Religion focuses on the external rather than the internal. Uh-oh. <laughs> hey, look! Religion focuses on the external rather on the internal, rather than the internal. Uh, Matthew chapter 23, start at verse 25, if you follow along with me. It says this. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. 
I need to tell you that the Pharisees are pretty high up guys, right? They're the guys who are telling the people what they need to do, how they need to do it, right? So Jesus says to them, What well, do you teach the law and Pharisees? You hypocrites. You clean the outside of the cup and the dish, but inside they are full of greed and self indulgence. Blind Pharisee. First clean the inside of the cup and the dish, and then the outside also will be clean. Would you pray with me, Father God? We pray that in the reading of your word this morning, this verse and the verses to come, that you would shine light into us, that your Holy Spirit would discern your truth for us, and that God, you would empower us with the power of your Holy Spirit, that your word would just permeate us, and as we walk out this place today, we would walk out changed, transformed people by your grace, and that we would seek to do your word. Thank you, God, for your word. Bless it as we talk about it this morning. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So, there's a problem in the world today, folks. See, we have a holy God, but we have an unholy people. There's a gap between the holy God and the unholy me. Okay? So we have holy God and unholy me. The gap between us and God. Religion attempts to close the gap between our sinfulness and God's holiness with human effort. Religion says if I do stuff, or don't do stuff, then I'll be good with God. Try harder, be better, do those things. It's a long list we created in religion. The do's and don'ts, be nice, help others, don't drink, smoke, or chew, and don't go with guys and girls who do. <laughs> That's not my saying. That's a saying from years ago in the church. Don't drink, smoke, or chew. Don't go with guys and girls who do. And somehow, if we do the do's and we don't do the don'ts, somehow we bridge the gap and we're good enough to be with God. I say hogwash. That's not right. Religion doesn't bring us any closer to God. It's us dancing around and doing stuff that makes no difference. Because that's what our goal is. Jesus is saying to us, don't be like those Pharisees. Jesus, in this passage, in Matthew chapter 23, in the span of 16 verses, Jesus calls the Pharisees hypocrites six times. Now I need you to know and understand that the Pharisees, I'm not going to you guys, the Pharisees are sitting right here. He's got a room full of people. They've been testing him. They've been asking questions. And he starts talking about the Pharisees like they ain't in the room, but they're sitting right there. And he's preaching and saying, Pharisees, you're hypocrites. Can you imagine these leaders of the people? The ones who break down the law for you, who tell you what you need to do to get close to God. Sitting right there. And this guy is doing what? Hypocrites? I ain't no hypocrite. I am the best. That's what a Pharisee would say, right? Look at me. I am the example. Jesus says six times in 16 verses, you're a hypocrite. Pharisees put on big religious shows. They have long prayers. They stand on the street corner and they say, Oh, dear God, thank you that I'm not like that guy over there. A wretched sinner. I'm not pointing at you. <laughs> I just want to make sure I don't want anybody's feelings. But that's what a Pharisee would do. He'd stand there in his nice robes and all his ornamentation, and he would preach at the top of his lungs to God. And he would make sure everybody heard how good he was and what they needed to do to be like him. Jesus is saying, don't be like them. Showy clothes, religious and pious. And then they, as if that's not enough, the Pharisees keep on a bunch of rules, rule after rule for everybody else to follow. Don't eat the wrong foods, don't hang out with sinners, on and on and on. For them, it's all about religion, all about the external. 
Religion is all about do's and don'ts, rules and regulations, about bridging the gap between a holy God and an unholy me with human effort. And I gotta tell you something, a little history lesson. If we go back to the Old Testament. After Ezra and Nehemiah brought the people back from Babylon, they rebuilt the temple, they're rebuilding Jerusalem. They're teaching, reteaching the law now, because the law had been forgotten. Those Ten Commandments, all the, the covenant between God and His people. So they're reteaching it. And they say, the religious leaders, they're angry. They're kind of pointing out to the people, you know, you haven't been able to keep the law, and you're the reason why we keep getting in bondage. Right? So you look at the history of the Old Testament. They follow God. Things were great. They get comfy. They move away from God. Things get bad. Then all of a sudden, somebody conquers them, takes them into slavery, and God says, you weren't paying attention. You're not doing what I asked you to do. And then they'd say, cry out to God, and God would say, okay, I'll rescue you, and I'll bring you back. So these guys are telling, the religious leaders are telling the people, it's because you can't keep the Ten Commandments. We're going to help you out. We're going to make some new rules to make sure nobody breaks the law, the original rule. Does that sound familiar? We're going to make some new rules, new laws, to make sure that you follow the other ones. So they added 600 man-made laws to the law that Moses had already given them for God. 600, over 600 laws. These man-made laws became known as offense laws in order to, it was in their mind that they were going to protect the Torah, the first five books of the, of the Old Testament, the covenant, the Ten Commandments, the Levitical law, that in doing these, coming up with all these 614 other laws, they would somehow protect and preserve what God had already asked them to do. It was kind of overwhelming. Because it's crazy. Okay, so God, this is another example. God says, remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. Seems pretty simple, right? You remember the day of rest, God's day, you focus upon Him, you keep it holy, you don't let unholy things enter into that day, you are reverent towards God, you focus upon Him, that's all you got to do. They came up with 65 laws in order to keep the Sabbath. Does this make sense to anybody? <laughs> 65 laws on the Sabbath. That in order to keep the one good law that God gave them, all of a sudden you've got to do 65 other things just to do the one. It sounds like government <laughs> in action. It's crazy. Why do we think God needs our help? Making laws. God gave the Ten Commandments, and we decided to make it a little more burdensome and complex in order to help God out. Maybe this is why Jesus is so passionate about these Pharisees and about the law. You know? uh, in that same chapter, Matthew chapter 23, back up in the beginning in verse 2 and 4, it says this in the common English it says, The legal experts and the Pharisees sit on Moses' seat, they have some authority. They're there for a reason. Therefore, you must take care to do everything they say. However, but don't do what they do. Y'all thought it was your grandma who said, do as I say, not what I do. It's Jesus. Pharisees said, on those seat, therefore, you must take care to do everything they say, but don't do what they do. For they, like, to tie together heavy packs that are impossible to carry, then they put them on the shoulders of other people that are unwilling to lift a finger to move them. So he's giving you this little metaphor that says they make the law more burdensome by putting all this other stuff in it, and then they put it on you, but they won't help you carry it. They'll just say, look at me, because I'm better than anybody else. And then he goes on in 16 verses to call him hypocrites six times. Remember, they're in the same room. This is kind of some brutal speak here from Jesus. Jesus would, would be kind of bold in this room. 
So if you've ever thought, I want to believe in God, but there are just too many laws, too many rules, I want you to know that it's not a reflection of the heart of God to have a burdensome law that we could never accomplish. Talk about that a little bit. But this is what people added to what God had already established. It was a way for them to close the gap between a holy God and an unholy me. And the laws that God established are not to confine us, but to free us to have life. So now on to the good news. There's some good news today. I want you, if you've got your Bible or your advice, to turn over to Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3, starting at verse 20. And this is going to be some good, good news for us today. Romans chapter 3, starting at verse 20, it says this. Therefore, no one will be declared righteous in God's sight by the works of the law. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of our sin. But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known, to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. Sounds pretty simple. So let's unpack it just a little bit. We're going to break it down into three simple thoughts. You cannot earn God's acceptance by obeying the law. We cannot earn our way to salvation. You can't earn God's acceptance by obeying law. No matter how hard you try, no matter how religious you are, no matter how many good deeds you do, no matter how many bad things you avoid, you cannot earn God's acceptance by obeying law. Religion says you please God by your good works. Do good, don't do bad. Go to church, be a good person, get baptized, read the Bible, don't drink, don't smoke, don't chew, and don't go with guys or girls who do. That's religion. Our God tells us can't earn your way. You can't earn my acceptance by obeying the law. But God's word says this in Romans chapter 3, verse 28. The first part says, therefore no one will be declared righteous in God's sight by the words of the law. Kind of emphasizes that point. No one, I love absolutes, dislike them when my kids use them because they don't know how to use them. But I love it when God uses absolutes because, oh my goodness, it's telling us something really important. No one will be declared righteous in God's sight by the works of the law. No one. It's pretty simple. It doesn't matter what kind of church you go to. You can be Nazarene like Jesus was. <laughs> or you can go to one of those other churches. It doesn't matter. If you believe Jesus is Son of God, Die on the cross, save you from your sins, give you eternal life, go and faith. It doesn't matter how holy you act, how good a show you put on, how hard you try, you cannot be good enough to please God by your external works. You cannot please God by just doing the works of the law. It's impossible, dare I say, and use an absolute. So that raises the question, why in the world would God give us the law? Why would he give it to us if we couldn't do it? If we can't live up to it, why did God establish it in the first place? Why did he spend all that time with Moses saying this is the way things need to be? I you ask. Because number two says, the purpose of the law is to show you and I your need, desperate, overwhelming need of a Savior. We can't do it, folks. We cannot be holy by acts. We require the shed blood of Jesus Christ. We need, every single one of us, a Savior. So let's look at the second part of that first verse, chapter, from, uh, chapter 3, verse 20. It says, In the beginning, therefore, no one will be declared righteous in God's sight by the words of the law. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of our sin. 
the law helps us understand we need God. We need Jesus. The law helps us to understand, well, it helps us to not get ahead of ourselves, right? Because if I can just survive on my own and get along comfy, what am I going to be God for? My brother says it all the time. I got a house, got a sports car, kids in college, got all the stuff, you know. What do I need God for? I'm not very happy about all those things. The real purpose of life, there is the eternity that we want to talk about. We aren't here just for that length of an hour. We need a Savior. This is what's so important, and we need to spend a few moments here, because it's more of a common belief today that people would say, I'm not a bad person. Did you all say that about yourself? I'm not a bad person. I haven't done too many bad things. It's a lie. All of us have. If we look on it in the grand scale, big picture, we've all seen the fallen short of the glory of the God. Matter whether it was murder, an addiction issue, a little white, white lie when I was five years old. We need a savior. Good. You might say I'm not a bad person, but my comeback would be you're a sinner. I am too. You're a sinner, I'm a sinner. Some of you might say, well, don't judge me, get a little defensive. I don't know if you've never done that before. I'm not going to judge you. Because you just said, don't judge me. You might say, don't judge me. Who are you to judge me? I'm not a sinner. Or you might say, what about Bob? Bob's way worse than I am. You know, we always got somebody that we can point to. My daughter says, well, Riley. <laughs> And Riley says, Oh, Michaela! We know that God. Because we all know, we try to make light of it, but this is not a light subject, folks. We're all sinners. All in need of a Savior. This is why the law is so important. It actually shows us that every single one of us, sinners, all of us, is in need of a Savior. None of us can earn God's acceptance by obeying the law. But the purpose of the law is to show each of us our need of a Savior. It's a little exercise. How many of you have ever told a lie? Raise your hand. Do not raise your hand, you lie. <laughs> it's one of the first things we learn to do as a kid, isn't it? We learn to lie to protect ourselves. We think we're not going to get in trouble if we lie. Learn really fast, you get in more trouble with you all. Two punishments. How many of you, maybe, maybe, maybe you just don't raise your hand on this one, how many of you have ever stolen something? I'll be honest, I was kidding. Okay. No, I didn't say it was How many of you have ever coveted somebody else's stuff? Trying to tell my wife right now. <laughs> Mark, he's got a motorcycle. Larry's got a motorcycle. Brian's got a motorcycle. I can list off and on and on and on and on. I don't have a motorcycle. I don't have a motorcycle. <laughs> I want a motorcycle. Put somebody in the back. It's company. That's what's bad about it. God hasn't blessed me with a motorcycle in the <laughs> But I look at them and I say, so nice to have one of those. I don't want to seem harsh or critical or make you all feel bad, but they're all wretched people. <laughs> <laughs> and I will tell you, I am the greatest. The greatest of sinners, the greatest of wretches. The good news, because that's the bad news. The good news is we have a Savior, and His name is Jesus Christ. 
And while we were in the act of sin, in open rebellion, Jesus died to save us. While we were at our worst, he was at his best to save us. To save us from ourselves. To save us from the penalty that sin brings. So number one, we can't perform our way to God. We can't bridge the gap between holy God and unholy me. And number two, the purpose of the law is to show us our need of a Savior found in Jesus Christ. And number three is really, really, I can say it again, really good news. It's this. Being right with God comes by faith in Christ, Jesus Christ alone. You might think there's a long list of rules and regulations before you can get saved. You're wrong. And I'm so glad. Being right with God comes by faith in Jesus Christ alone. The way that we're made right with God is not by religious works. It's not by trying harder, but it's trusting in the perfect work, the redemptive work of Jesus Christ. And number three, being right with God comes by faith in Jesus Christ alone is such good news. This is what Paul says at the end of our little passage. This righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. Maybe you ought to get your Bible out and underline that section and highlight all. Because every single one of us has got one of those extra grace required people we think maybe Jesus didn't quite like to say them, but he did. For all who will believe. And that's it. That's all it says. It's so simple. It doesn't matter how bad your past has been. It doesn't matter how bad your present is right now. When you put your faith in Jesus, your sins are forgiven. Washed white as snow. New creation. Holy. A child of the king. Made completely new. You don't need religion. You need Jesus Christ. You don't need Jesus plus good works. Because that kind of says that Jesus wasn't an all-the-way kind of guy. He is. He did everything for us. Once and for all. You don't need Jesus plus religious effort. Just Jesus. We're not talking moral entity. A following of morals. We're talking Christianity. Jesus Christ. <coughs> Redeemer. Friend. Brother. In the faith. Do you ever think about the criminal on the cross? Some of you know that story. Jesus was put on the cross. We're going to be celebrating his resurrection in just a few weeks here. But Jesus put on the cross. There's two guys. One on either side of him. One of them kind of likes Jesus. The other one doesn't. You know, that's kind of a easy way to sum it up. One's spouting insults at him, challenging him, taunting him. And the other one's defending him and saying, Jesus, when you come into your kingdom, would you just remember me? And what did Jesus say to him? Somebody just tell him. Today you're going to be with me in paradise. He had faith in who Jesus was. That guy, he couldn't get off the cross and go kneel at an altar and accept Jesus as Savior. He didn't go get baptized. He didn't go join the Church of the Nazarene. He's not a voting member of a denomination. He couldn't do any of those things. And Jesus gave him eternity because of faith. One simple act of faith. Anytime someone says, I don't want to follow God, I just, he's a killjoy God. Too many rules and regulations. We need to understand that religion has complicated what God has made so simple. Religion has complicated what God made simple. You don't believe me? I want you to look at this. Adam and Eve. You see, here's the deal. The Bible starts out with two great books, or two great chapters in the first book of Genesis. Talking about creation, talking about man and woman. 
God is wearing my clothes. Everything's going to be dirty. And then chapter 3 comes along. And the man and the woman sin. And the rest of the story has been changed forever. That's not the way God planned it. He planned it this way, and then we put a bump in the road. And it's a big bump. Let it sin. God made it simple. You can do all this, just don't eat back. Okay? And he says, for if you do, you surely, you surely die. Simple. I mean, we tell our kids today, go do that, they'll die. Some kids would say, let's find out. <laughs> Maybe I'll prove you wrong. And I won't die. But there is the problem. Let's find out. Let's test it. It was simple in the beginning, folks. Be in the garden with me. Spend life. God, walking with you. You have your choice of all of creation. The animals, the fruit, the vegetables, all the stuff. Just don't eat one piece of fruit. And messed it up. And the outcome was death. The fruit that would surely make them die. It stole their life from them. Religion has complicated what God's made simple. But it's not complicated. Jesus, later, would be asked one of those tricky questions. Pharisee standing there in front of everybody said, I've had enough of you calling me hypocrite. I'm going to try to catch you in something. So he says, Jesus, out of all these laws, which is the most important? Now the Pharisee's talking about the 614 laws. And Jesus says, see, your religion has complicated what my father made simple. Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And love your neighbor as yourself. Please, than any other person. There is no law above this. Simple. If you couldn't get the ten, I'll give you two. If you can do two, love God with everything you are and your neighbor as yourself, you have fulfilled the law. Don't make it complicated. Don't make 614 laws on how to get one and two done right. Just do one and two. What religion complicates with laws, Jesus simplifies with love. What's the most important commandment? Love God with your neighbor. The bad news is, folks, we've seen every single one of us. And we are in desperate need of the same. Every day of our life. The good news is Jesus died for us. God forgave our sins. We can't earn it. We don't deserve it. And yet, he did it. It's not about being perfect. It's about Jesus. Jesus and God say, be holy as I am holy. We're a denomination that believes you ought to try to do that. But you can't do it by yourself. It is only through the shed blood of Jesus that we're able to do all those things. To live and to love God with all that we are and love our neighbor as ourselves. If that's where you are this morning, in any part of your journey, Maybe you're questioning about all the steps. Maybe life's not going great. And you're wondering, what is the thing that's missing in your life that you should be doing that you aren't doing? I want to point you back to the simplicity of God. What religion made complicated, Jesus answered with If you are looking and searching there's a Savior who is willing to forgive your sins right now, this very morning. All he asks is that you have faith and believe. Simple as that. Very I'm going to ask you I just want to open up our offers. This is a challenge to you this morning. If you feel God yearning after you, 
This is a time when you can just come and say, God, I, I don't have all the rules and regulations. I couldn't tell you what 613 of the 614 laws are. If you just come still yourself and listen to the heartbeat of the Savior who says, believe. That's all you need to do. I'm just going to invite you to come as we begin to pray. These altars are open today. Father God, I just thank you so much. Thank you that you are the Savior that we need. Jesus, the Son. The one who is the atonement. And God, we are so very sorry we have made it so complicated the work that you began so long ago. We apologize for bringing in our ways of doing things when your way is perfect. God, we just come before you this morning, each of us, confessing our need for Jesus as our Lord and Savior. And we have faith. We believe in him as the Son the atonement, the blood that covers all, that is our righteousness. We pray, God, that you would continue your sanctifying work in each of us this morning, that you would, through your grace, bring about our holiness in this world, that you would transform us into the image of your Son, Jesus, so that all the world would know there is a great and awesome and sovereign God. He cared so much about us that he sent his son to die for all of humanity. And in that belief, all will be saved. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus, for your word and your love. God, we confess, we just don't have a lot of understanding about all this stuff, but we just pray that you would empower us to dig into your word, to sit with our brothers and sisters, to talk, uh, to pray and discuss with you, Father. Would you give us the truth? In a world that just seems like there is no truth. Make us bold, Father. Empower us by your Holy Spirit to share the love of Jesus Christ in this world today. Draw us to those places that we would call dark, Father, where you need us most. Would you keep us from dragging our feet with a sparkle in our eye, Father? some warmth in our hands as we reach out to brothers and sisters. And in all of that, God, as we go to shine light, would you teach us? Would you shine your light back on us, Father? Reminding us each day that we need you. Bless us as we go, Father. May your will be done here in Pastor. pray for kingdom growth, God. We pray that brothers and sisters, complete strangers, would come to know the saving grace of Jesus Christ and that your will would be done in all our lives. We pray in Jesus' name. Folks, I'm going to dismiss you. I, I need the church board to stay and come right down to the front row. But I'm just going to dismiss you to a great day. I'm going to invite you to check in with the Team Challenge folks at their booth and ask them any questions you may have. And be blessed by that as you go. Have a wonderful day, folks.